Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Welcome everyone to lecture five of week five of Adams to Materials. Today I'd like to uh, give you an example of an application of a, a non-equilibrium molecular dynamic simulation to compute a very important materials property. In particular, we're going to talk about calculation of uh, thermal transport. Okay, uh, and uh, the goal is to understand how phonons carry heat in a material by doing molecular dynamic simulations. Um, so there's two ways uh, of, of doing molecular dynamic simulations of transport properties. One is to use equilibrium MD simulations. Um, but uh, it, today we're going to focus on the use of non-equilibrium simulations to achieve this. Okay, so uh, to look at thermal transport in, in non-equilibrium MD, what I need to do is impose a temperature gradient in the system. Okay, so uh, I we've learned about thermostats last week. Uh, we can put a thermostat to maintain a region uh, at some temperature and a separate thermostat to maintain uh, a, a, a temperature, a, a different temperature at a different location. Okay, so I can impose a hot region and a cold region and then um, let the system evolve doing uh, molecular dynamic simulations and compute the heat flux uh, that uh, uh, the, the flux of energy due to the uh, temperature difference and then use Fourier's law uh, to compute thermal conductivity. Okay, just as, as a reminder Thermal conductivity kappa is the ratio between heat flux and the temperature gradient uh, in the simulation. That's one approach. An alternative approach is to impose a known heat flux and measure the temperature gradient as opposed to imposing a temperature difference with the thermostat and measuring the heat flux. So we're going to discuss the second approach and we're going to use it and uh, we're going to use an approach uh, 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 due to uh, Miller Plaza uh, in order to impose the heat flux. Okay, so uh, the approach is very simple and very clever. It involves taking my system that I'd like to study and chopping it into uh, small bins. Okay, and then we're going to generate the heat flux by taking, picking the hottest atom in the cold bin. Okay, so the cold bin is going to be the bin on the left. Okay, so I'm going to pick out of all those atoms in the in this bin, I'm going to pick the one with the highest energy, highest kinetic energy, so the hottest atom. Okay, right there. And I'm going to pick the coldest atom in the hot bin. The hot bin is going to be the bin in the middle. So I'm going to pick an atom from there, okay, and what those Gaussians mean is the essentially the maxwell boltzmann distribution of kinetic energies that we have in each hot in the hot and cold bin. So what I'm going to do is pick the hottest atom in the cold bin, the coldest atom in the hot bin, and swap their momenta. If I swap their momenta, I'm going to transfer energy from hot to cold, and with in time, what will happen is the hot bin will increase its temperature, the cold bin will decrease its temperature, and I'm going to generate a heat flux. Okay, so I artificially impose a heat flux from cold to hot, and of course the material is going to carry that heat internally back from the hot to the cold bin. And that's what I, that's what I'm going to measure. Of course, as I do that, the, this distribution, the two Gaussians that I've drawn, move up and down, and the, the method, of course, works as long as the hot hottest atom in the cold bin and the coldest atom in the hot bin um, uh, allow us to transfer energy from hot to cold. Okay, so with time 
I keep doing this periodically, swapping atomic velocities every, say, 100 molecular dynamic steps, and uh, in time, a steady state develops. I measure a temperature gradient, and using the same Fourier uh, law, I can obtain the thermal conductivity, okay? All right, so why should I do molecular dynamics uh, of thermal transport? Well, th there are some advantages to them, and the advantages are very significant. Uh, first of all, have a, 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 an explicit, essentially perfect description of all phonon processes, okay? I'm not making any approximation in terms of what phonons carry energy, how phonons interact with one another. Everything is explicitly described. Now, if you remember what we've learned during the lectures, uh, uh, is that if uh, within the harmonic approximation, if I take my system of atoms and I uh, expand the potential energy up to the second order and I do a diagonalization of the Hessian matrix, my system can be described as a set of non-interacting independent harmonic oscillators. If that's the case within the harmonic approximation, the thermal uh, uh, conductivity of the material is infinitely large. Okay, there's no scattering mechanism to slow down the heat of uh, the the flux of heat. Uh, the all the scattering between the phonons that then that result in a finite thermal conductivity come from the unharmonicities of the potential. And if I do molecular dynamic simulation simulations. I get that for free, okay? The description is inherently unharmonic uh, and it will follow my potential without making any approximations, second order, third order, fourth order, anything at any temperature will be described. described. The other important uh, advantage of doing molecular dynamic simulations is that interfaces, defects, free surfaces, all those things are also describe explicitly with no approximations, okay? We actually have every atom in the interface. And uh, so that's also very good and very desirable to look at interfaces, free surfaces, defects. There are some cons to uh, doing molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, one is that these are expensive simulations, okay? So uh, the, uh, re regarding system size, or restricted to tens to hundreds of nanometers. Uh, in time scales, we're restricted to also tens to maybe 100 nanoseconds. So uh, short size and time scales. And this, of course, restricts the wavelengths of the phonons that we can simulate and also the mean free paths of the phonons that we can simulate. So that has to be taken into account, and uh, one has to understand uh, the results that, that, that one gets in these simulations. In, in many materials, it is estimated that uh, m more than 50% of the heat is carried, is transported by uh, phonons uh, with characteristic sizes bigger, larger than a micron. Okay. So, of course, all those will be uh, ignored, okay? All right. Of course, there's fundamental uh, limitations of the interatomic potentials. The, the prediction is going to be as accurate as the interatomic potential uh, is, and so that's also a source of errors. And finally, we're doing classical dynamics, okay? Not quantum dynamics. And we know that our descriptions uh, breaks down at low temperatures or for high frequency modes. Okay, so we are only okay as long as kT is larger compared with h bar omega. Okay, so high frequency modes are not described very accurately. Now, fortunately for us, uh, high frequency modes uh, tend to be optical modes. They tend to have very small group velocities that don't carry a lot of heat. So uh, we can get away with classical mechanics 
for thermal transport uh, you know, more than you would imagine uh, at first thought. But for things like carbon nanotubes that have very high frequencies, MDs would not be very accurate. Okay, so uh, given, the, given that, uh, let's talk about uh, some results and the type of analysis that one has to do uh, of this simulation. So first of all, um, we're assuming that we're in a linear regime where the thermal conductivity is the ratio between heat flux and temperature gradient. Uh, that means that we are assuming that the temperature gradient is proportional to the heat flux. Uh, that, of course, works at small temperature gradients and for relatively small heat fluxes. The question is if in MD simulations, given that our size scales are so small, the temperature gradients are very, very large. So what is, uh, does uh, the Fourier law still hold under these conditions? And the, and the answer is uh, yes. You have to be a bit careful, okay, you can see here what uh, we're plotting is heat flux as a function of temperature gradient. You can see that these are all MD simulations. Um, you can see that for low heat fluxes, we have uh, linear behavior. For the larger heat fluxes, we start deviating from this linearity. This is uh, phonon transport in aluminum, okay? Just the phonon transport in, in the metal. Uh, now, let's talk a little bit more about other results that exemplify what MD can do in thermal transport. These are results where we show the inverse thermal conductivity as a function of inverse uh, sample size and at different temperatures, okay? And what you see here is this linear relationship between inverse thermal conductivity and inverse sample size. Uh, for all of all, all of these temperatures. So the first thing you see is that at higher temperatures, uh, the thermal conductivity um, goes down, okay, the inverse thermal conductivity goes up, and that's of course because of increased scattering due to more unharmonicities. The higher the temperature, uh, the more unharmonic the system is, and the more scattering mechanisms that you have. So M MD captures that explicitly. There is no knob to turn, there's nothing. The simulation just predicts that on its own. Of course, with the limitations of the interatomic potential. The other interesting thing that you see here is that for a given size, the thermal conductivity is size dependent. Okay, And the reason why it's size dependent is that the specimen size limits the maximum mean free path that the uh, phonons can have. Of course, it also limits the maximum wavelength. Uh, but it's the mean free path that governs these size effects that you see there. And that's why uh, what we find is that, uh, again, this is inverse sample size. So on the right, uh, we have small samples uh, with high resistivity as we move to the left. The conductivity goes up as the size, uh, as we increase the size. If we take and extrapolate to zero, to, uh, zero inverse size, this would be the bulk, uh, you know, infinitely large materials. And from these extrapolations, we can predict the thermal conductivity of the bulk samples and the slope of this curve. Of, of, of these uh, linear relationships uh, tells us about the, uh, the mean free path uh, of, of the phonons. Okay? So you can get very interesting properties out of this. Now, uh, let me tell you a little bit about some near results uh, from our group that I think also exemplify the, the power of MD simulations in this field. So we were interested in understanding the difference in thermal transport in uh, super lattice, silicon germanium super lattice. Okay, so you can see that all of these systems, there's germanium in yellow and silicon and germanium and so on and so forth. And uh, 
So super light is a very interesting understanding comparing nanowires, circular and uh, square cross-section nanowires, with thin film super lattice. Uh, super lattice that are periodic uh, in the cross-sectional direction. So this guy keeps going forever in the perpendicular directions. There's no scattering, okay? So we perform this type of non-equilibrium simulations. Uh, these are the type of temperature profiles that we obtain. You can see that we can capture the interfaces, right? At each interface, silicon germanium interface, we have a little bit of a jump in the temperature. And from that, we can measure the interfacial resistivity very accurately. And we can also compute the effective thermal conductivity of each section of the material. So a lot of detail that you get out of this simulation. Now, the interesting results that, I'd like, that I want to discuss with you are the following. So uh, what I'm showing here in this plot on the top left is the thermal conductivity, kappa, as a function of the super lattice periodic length okay, uh, for the three systems. The thin film is in green uh, up here. That's the thin film. Um, and then the two nanowires. Okay. Uh, what you see, is, there's a couple of interesting things. Uh, the thermal conductivity of the, th of the thin film is higher than that of the nanowires. And that's very easy to understand. The wires are very small. There are a few nanometers in diameter. So there's a huge... Uh, surface scattering in these wires, and that reduces the thermal conductivity. That's fine. Uh, the other interesting thing that you observe that has been known for some time is that as a function of super lattice period, the thermal conductivity of this specimen, the, the specimen is about 100 nanometers long. Uh, the, uh, as the thermal, as, as the um, super lattice period goes down, the thermal conductivity initially also goes down because we have more interfaces, uh, but the thermal conductivity reaches a minimum and then it shoots back up, okay? And uh, this minimum and the increase for very small um, super lattice periods uh, is an indication that the phonons start seeing the super lattice as a homogeneous material. Uh, the period of the super lattice is smaller than the uh, wavelength of the phonons that carry most of the heat. And those phonons live in the super lattice and can carry heat without scattering at the, interfacial, at the interfaces in the super lattice. That effect is well known. So uh, these results are, are more or less what you would have expected. Now, uh, something very interesting happens when we reduce the specimen length, not the period of the super lattice, but the overall size of the specimen. Okay, So when we reduced it from 105 nanometers to about 70 nanometers and then to 35 nanometers, what we found was that the size effects, the specimen size effect in the thin films that's in green were very, very uh, sharp, very abrupt. Okay, uh, And specimen size effects in the nanowires were not particularly strong. That led to a very interesting observation that for small specimen sizes, the thin film here in, in uh, green had a lower thermal conductivity than the nanowires. Okay? Um, and the reason why that's very interesting is that in many applications we would like materials with very low thermal conductivity. And uh, of course, dyno wires are good for that. But what we found is that for s small specimen sizes, uh, thin film super lattices, super lattice might be even better than, than nano wires. Okay. All right. So uh, again, MD simulations of thermal transport uh, were using, making use of what we learned about statistical mechanics and the fact that uh, MD uh, can be used under non-equilibrium conditions because there's no assumptions 
of uh, equilibrium in the system in, in the uh, in the equations uh, to predict thermal conductivity. And uh, the last thing I'd like to do in this lecture is to introduce you to a tool, uh, to a, a, a nano half tool that allows you to allows users to perform thermal transport calculations using molecular dynamics uh, in super lattice or uh, monolithic uh, semiconducting systems. So you can build your own super lattice, okay, the, specifying the period of the super lattice, how many repetitions of the super lattice you'd like to simulate, and then click a button, you the simulation runs, it gives you back a temperature gradient from which you can obtain, and the tool obtains, the thermal conductivity. In one of the homework assignments, uh, you will use this tool uh, to predict the thermal conductivity of silicon samples. Um, okay, that's all I had. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in the last lecture of Atoms to Materials.